Okay, it is 12.04.50. Uh, this is just a, a quick startup uh, to say hello. Uh, and uh, let's get diving into the program. Uh, what we have here today is buying your first home. Uh, and we have two really great speakers here. We have Gagan Khan, uh, who is in real estate law. Uh, and she and James Selig, who is a realtor uh, and who has graciously sponsored a few of our events, are, are presenting on buying your first home. Uh, it's a very, very scary endeavor. I'll let them give a little bit more of an introduction on themselves, and then we'll dive right into the deep of things. Um, and just so you know, we have some handouts that will be going out after the fact. Uh, and to, to be super clear, uh, make sure that you consult with an attorney if you're trying to do this. Do not con do not construe this as us giving legal advice to you. These are the legal implications, uh, the the ethical considerations and everything that goes into buying a house. Make sure that you do your own independent research on these things and don't just construe this as, as that advice. That's the disclaimer. Uh, and I'll, I'll pop it over really quickly. Um, first to Gagan and then to James, if you'll do a, just a, a brief introduction. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Thanks for showing up during this lunchtime CLE. My name is Gagan Khan. I'm an attorney. Uh, I have my own boutique firm. Uh, we practice real estate and commercial litigation. And so we kind of hone in on real estate. And in my practice, I see a lot of issues people have after buying a house that are preventable and you can prevent them. So I today, what I want to cover is uh, one, the process of buying a home. Two, how to prevent uh, issues with the title and how to prevent yourself from buying a home that could be a lemon. And three, litigation and how to resolve potential legal issues. Okay. Very good. Hi, I'm James Selig. I'm with Keller Williams Realty Memorial uh, in Houston. Um, I am a recovering banker. Did that first. And have been selling real estate for 20 years. Um, I am a licensed broker. Um, my practice is all over the Houston area and down to Galveston, which is where I'm originally from. Um, and um, we'll be talking about the process of, of buying a home, uh, working through an agent, um, and some some things to be aware of as you're doing that, because it's not a straight, always a straightforward process. On it. And I think it's really cool. Y'all are actually going to get credit for hearing me talk. I think that's <laughs> great. Well, um, let's jump straight into it. Uh, and so um, I think our first topic is traditional purchase from a seller. Uh, yes. Um, there's two different things. One, there's if you a normal resale. If I was selling my house to you, that would be a resale. Or there's buying a brand new home from a builder. And process can be fairly similar, actually very similar, but there's some there are some differences. So we'll cover the buying a home that's a resale on there. Uh, let me, can I share my screen? Of course. Cool. Let me. There we go. And now I just got to figure out. I'm really bad at PowerPoint. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. So first of all, there are standardized contracts that we use uh, as real estate agents. Uh, drafted primarily by a committee of attorneys, real estate brokers, and a member of the public uh, with the Texas Real Estate Commission. Um, and you can see um, Trek appoints six members, uh, State Bar of Texas appoints six members, and there's one public member appointed by uh, the uh, by the governor. And uh, we can submit suggestions for changes on the on, on the different forms. The Texas Association of Realtors takes what Trek does, and they promulgate their own forms. Uh, and they have more forms that they use on there. The benefit of the forms is that it makes a transaction more efficient. Um, and it also keeps real estate agents from trying to practice law. For some reason, that is frowned upon. And um, But the main thing is, is to keep a transaction moving. Um, it, there's no 
real difference between buying a hundred thousand dollar condo than there is a you know two million dollar house. Uh, the same process is the same. A lot of the verbiage is the same. A couple of little differences here and there on the forms, but basically the same. If every contract started by scratch, it's a process that would take a long time to get through. And it would be more expensive for the consumer to get through on there. Um, the basic process. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, potential pitfalls is when one party to a transaction wants to cross something out in the standardized contracts. As real estate agents, we can't interpret the language for our clients because we're not attorneys. So when that happens, basically, I have to tell my client, okay, you need to give this to your attorney for them to tell you what the effects, how this affects you. Uh, no matter how small it is, I can't interpret it. Generally, what happens is the deal stops right there because the seller, the buyers and the sellers don't really want to have to do that. The other thing is, is it keeps us from putting a lot of stuff in special provisions and practicing law. Uh, doesn't totally stop that. Uh, all we can really put in special provisions or should put in special provisions are contract or basically contract items that um, there's, it's not an if this, then that. It's basically something like seller will allow the buyer to do a walkthrough of the property within 48 hours of closing. Simple stuff like that. Or seller will have the house professionally cleaned prior to closing. Um, that's the extent of what we can really add in there uh, to it. So again, it keeps everything going and minimizes the pitfalls. Uh, the basic process is find a realtor to help you. Um, uh, you want someone who's going to want to know what your motivation and needs are. If you talk to one who doesn't really seem that interested, you might talk to another as well. Because, you know, I know from my standpoint, I like my clients when they're buying something. I want it to be something that they can live in a long time and be happy. And that means I really need to pay attention to what they're telling me. Um and in and being able to point out when we're in a house what fits that and what may not fit that so that they can make an informed decision. Basically, it's taking them back to what they tell me so that they make a good decision on it. Um, you want somebody who can guide you knowledgeably through the process of finding the right house um, on there. You want somebody who can take you through the process of negotiating for the house and can get you knowledgeably from contract to close on there. Um, and in basically starting October, August 17th, all my clients do sign one, not necessarily right at the beginning, but starting August 17th, before an agent can, uh, uh, by August 17th, before an agent can show you a property, they are going to have to have you sign a buyer's representation form. And, um, one thing you need to keep in mind is that um, uh, in Texas, we don't have dual representation. Uh, so a listing agent can never represent a buyer. Uh, they can treat them as a customer, treat them fairly and honestly, but they can never, ever represent the buyer. Basically, in Texas, an agent can represent a buyer with a buyer's representation, a seller with a listing agreement. Uh, or they can facilitate a transaction without, and this is key, without giving advice to either parties, which um, technically means that even if they're representing the seller, they can't give the seller advice on there. My office, we don't do that. If, if a buyer doesn't want to have an agent, they're going to sign off that they're representing themselves on there. Some can do it. A lot don't really know the process and don't do it well on there. So keep in mind, if you're out looking at houses and you call the listing agent, just know that listing agent shows you the property. They they will never represent you. Any questions? And, so far? and this is a good time uh, for me to pop in, James, just really quickly. Uh, I know that we as attorneys love to, to realize, hey, we don't have to have a realtor. Um, and is that the isn't incorrect, but at the same time, I, I will say my personal experience when I bought a home, uh, we talked to a number of realtors. We were trying to decide on 
uh, whether or not we went with one or another and ultimately ended up, uh, I, I won't name names and I'm not going to endorse anybody on, on any of this call, but I just want to be really clear. The realtor comes in and a lot of the benefit, as you heard James said, he can't interpret the contract. He cannot go through and give you that advice, but it comes from that knowledge of, of what goes into buying a home, of what what is standard, what is not standard, and can give you just that feedback. And as you read here, it, it's a fiduciary relationship toward the buyer. And so that's a, a really important um, understanding. And if you are thinking of buying a home, uh, even though you can be your own person, it is sometimes best to consider hiring somebody to help you with that. And uh, and I, I don't know if Gagan, if you had anything else that you want to add on that. Uh, a couple of things. I do recommend getting a realtor just because uh, sometimes you don't want to be your own attorney. There's an emotional aspect to it. You don't want to be your own realtor. While that is an option, you can represent yourself. Uh, the the other reason is that the realtor has experience where they can negotiate a deal for you and they can probably do it better than you um, in most cases. Uh, third thing is that uh, there was a recent uh, settlement and there was a lawsuit against realtors. So you are now able to negotiate the percentage you pay to your realtor. It is negotiable. So there's a room there for you to negotiate that and decide on a price and agree with the realtor what, what percentage they would take. So uh, not only you have the option, but it's a good idea to get somebody who's experienced. Awesome. Okay. Um, part of the process is after you meet with, sometimes people do it before they pick a realtor. A lot of people don't do it till they've talked to a realtor. Uh, you need to get pre-approved for your mortgage. And the, the more you, uh, you go through the process before you try to make an offer on a property, the better. Uh, if you don't have a mortgage officer, your real estate agent should be able to recommend some experienced mortgage officers to you. The benefits getting pre-approved are, one, really, I don't know of any seller who is negotiating with somebody where they have not provided either proof that they have cash to pay for the house or that they have been approved for a loan or at least be, been pre-qualified for a loan. Uh, I know that when I receive an offer on a listing that um, uh, where there is not a loan letter uh, included and they're, they're getting financing, um, I advise my clients to not negotiate until we see that. Um, because a lot of people say, oh, yeah, no problem. We can get approved. Well, the reality is until they get approved, we don't really know that um, on there. So it's really to your benefit as a buyer to make sure you're as much of that process as possible uh, before you start looking. Benefits are you're going to know the price range you can in. You're only going to look in houses that are in your price range. Uh, so you're not going to be wasting time. You'll have an idea of what your closing costs would look like and what your potential monthly payment would look like. Um, a lot of times people get approved up to a certain amount, but they're not comfortable that high. Uh, and um, so it's getting pre-approved first makes you know what it looks like so you can decide what you as a buyer are comfortable with. And James, from a realtor's perspective, do you ever advise your clients to have multiple different uh, pre-approval letters with different amounts? Uh, generally, uh, what I do urge them to do is decide on their lender before they go under contract. Because if you change a lender while you're under contract, I, you know, one of the things in the contract, there's lots of due dates and lots of contingency timeframes. And part of my job as an agent is to make certain my buyers are getting through the process on a timely basis. And if you change your lender, I can't guarantee you that. And I tell my clients that upfront in writing. Well, if they tell me they're changing lenders, I tell them uh, it then and in writing that I can't guarantee that they're going to meet all the, the deadlines if they do that. Um, it does not hurt to talk to different ones to find out their products. It can be hard. It's like trying to sometimes it's trying it's like trying to figure out which electric plan to choose uh, because it's not always an apples to apples conversation. The main thing is you want somebody who 
has a lot of experience um, in the pro in the mortgage process, and you want somebody preferably who has a lot of experience in their company because they um, uh, know how to work their company system to get things done faster than what would normally take place on there. Um, what we do is we get a loan letter uh, for a purchase for basically a purchase in the amount of what the offer is is what we try for. That way, the sellers don't have an idea of what the buyers can do. And then as we go through the process, we just get the, le the lender to provide a new loan letter with a higher amount. That's how we handle that. But I see all sorts of different things when I get an offer in on a listing. Any other questions on that piece? The next thing is, is finding the, the right house. A lot of times I get a call from people because they have found the house. They saw it online, they wanna see it. Um, and we kind of speed up the process for them uh, to get them in and you know get them with a mortgage person right away if they're really serious about buying. Um, um, the place I recommend if you're looking online at properties is HIR.com. It's the local Houston Association of Realtors multiple listing website. It is the most current, um, has the probably the most photos on there, uh, will allow you access to any 3D tours or video tours that are out there attached to the listing on there. Uh, it's just a really easy place to go and they've got a great app uh, that you can download or your agent can uh, send to you uh, to look for. A lot of times people will see a for sale by owner sign I encourage you to let you give the information to your agent, let your agent make contact. Uh, a lot of people will go to open houses on weekends. Um, if there's a house you're interested in and you're going to go to the open house to see it, see if your agent can go with you. It's always better. Your agent needs to see what you're seeing uh, so they can, you know, again, take you back to your needs and your motivation. And is this really going to be the right place for you? Uh, new home developments, we'll talk about a little more, but always go with your agent. Um, those nice, smiley, friendly people uh, in the uh, uh, sales offices and model homes always represent the builder. They're never going to represent you. And I'll give you a couple examples when we get to that section about how it really is helpful. Uh, again, uh, Texas doesn't have the dual representation. So please keep that in mind as you as you work with your agent. Uh, once you find the house, you're going to make your offer. So your agent's going to review the comparable sales, other pertinent factors like days on market, maybe having a chat uh, at least through text with the listing agent just to kind of see, is there something else going on? Because sometimes you'll make contact and you'll find out they have an offer they're already negotiating. And you, and if your clients are interested, you that one clues you in that you need to make a strong offer and get it in pretty quickly so that you have a shot at it. Um, uh, it's happened more than a few times where I've been able to get my clients, uh, as long as they move quickly uh, into something and beat somebody else out that had got their offer in first. Uh, a seller can accept your offer. Rarely do they accept it as is. Uh, they can reject it. Sometimes they just say, no, we're not even going to talk to you. Or usually they're going to provide a counter to your offer. And as you go through the negotiating process, your agent's going to advise you uh, the best way to go. Very generally in a negotiation, uh, um, basically most people are good for two to three rounds of back and forth. And after that, somebody starts getting a little upset. So we always try to keep that in mind um, as you go through. There are some people who, if you let them, would just keep negotiating. But at some point, you can take it to where the seller or the buyer is just going to say, no, we're, we're done and we're not doing any more and we don't even want to talk about it. Um, and I've actually had clients back out of something because it, usually on the buyer side, my buy, I've had buyers back out because the seller wanted to keep negotiating. And they just said, yeah, we're not going to do this. We can see this is not going to go well. So keep in mind, two to three rounds maybe of negotiation needs to get you where, where 
you're happy and the other side can be happy as well. Um, once all parties have signed the contract, it becomes effective. And there are lots of contingency dates in that contract which key off the effective date. And you need to be aware of what those dates are. So your agent should be telling you what those key dates are. And your agent needs to be checking in and making certain that you're doing what you need to be doing. Conversely, my assistant and I always are also checking in on the other side to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing as well. Because I don't like surprises. And my clients normally don't like surprises. So really, we're working both ends to make certain everybody's, you know, all everything's lining up the way it should on there. Um, and I, I see we have uh, Gagan went off to mute and I, I keep butchering your name. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Okay. A couple of things I wanted to add, uh, yeah. if, if you can go back to the slide. So about the, so as far as the process is concerned, once you have made the offer and the seller has accepted the offer, then there are essentially kind of two big steps. One is you sign the contract. And then two is you prepare for the closing. The closing is when you sign off on all the documents and close on the home and get the title to the property. So these are the two big steps. There are a lot of little ones, but these are the two major ones. Now, going to step one, which is signing the contract, we briefly touched upon it, but um, the standard contract, there's a standard contract that all realtors use. Um, I recommend it. A lot of times we as attorneys want to change it, and uh, James talked about it briefly. I don't recommend changing it from a legal st standpoint uh, because one, that contract has, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. It covers everything that you need to have covered in this purchase. The main thing that it covers for, from a legal standpoint is specific performance. So if things were to go south, somebody does not show up at closing, doesn't come to, to sell the property, the contract allows for specific performance. So you can go to court and ask for them to come to the closing and, and close on the property. So I, I just getting to the contract, I don't recommend changing it from the standard contract. The second thing that's important about the standard contract is the option period. Um, and James can probably elaborate on it too. An option period is a time period you get where you pay a small amount of money to kind of uh, lock in to be to to conduct your investigation into the property and so you pay maybe four hundred dollars five hundred dollars two hundred dollars a small amount of amount into escrow and then you get 10 or 15 days to conduct your investigation about the house if you don't like the house for any reason you can back out of the deal and that's what the option period is. So it's important to look into the option period in that contract when you are signing. Uh, the third thing that it allows for is it has all the provisions for inspection and title insurance, which will which does become important when you're buying a house. And we can talk about it a little bit more detail as we progress. But uh, inspection essentially is the inspection of the house to see the house is not a lemon. The title insurance is insurance on the title of your property to make sure that the title is clear and there are no issues with the title. And so these things all come in the standard contract. They're part of it. Uh, I've seen contracts that are not standard where some, the seller wrote it and presented it to a buyer. And it's always a red flag for us because <laughs> that means the seller wrote some favorable terms. And I've seen that in context of investors who buy you know, lots of properties, volume business, they give these, they don't like to use standard contracts because they like to, sometimes they like to keep the option open to back out of the deal. So um, again, standard contract is a good contract. It allows for specific performance and it gives you the option period and it allows you to get your inspection and get the title commitment. And if, if I can just pop in here really quickly too, um, the, the op, everything that you're hearing in this is in the standard contract. Uh, it, it's just your, your, your chart or excuse me, your, your realtor is probably going to recommend just using that. And that's a good recommendation. And just another plug for realtors are great. Um, and I promise this isn't like a sales pitch for getting a realtor, but when we were buying our house, our offer letter, um, basically we came in with financing and we found out that we had offered more cash to close than the other party. They had more financing um, that they would have to do. 
And it came down to, we all paid, we were offering less to buy the house, but more cash to close. And it ultimately came down to our letter and a picture of our cat sitting on a pile of cash mm -hmm. was honestly like the joking thing that we were like, we sent it to a realtor, like we promised we have cash and she put it in the letter and we were, we were like, literally like, Oh no, what, what just happened? We look like crazy people, but they, they accepted it um, because they were animal lovers themselves and they put that on public stuff. And so our realtor was like, Nope, let's go for it. And it won us the house. Um, so it, it, Standard contract, no seller is going to be like, no, we can't use that if they're reputable. Uh, and on top of that, just that experience and that knowledge that they can provide uh, a realtor can is great. So um, Gagan brought up about the option period. In Texas, uh, you negotiate an option period. And in Texas, during that period, a buyer can back out for any or no reason. There are some states where that's not the case. In Texas, you can back out, you can wake up and just say, yeah, you know, change my mind, don't want it. And that's happened. People sometimes get cold feet and they back out. Um, but, oops, sorry, uh, but to, when you're going to get your inspection and negotiate repairs and everything has to be negotiated and signed off on by 5 p.m. of the ending day of your option period. So you're going to want to hire a professional home inspector to conduct a thorough ins inspection of the property. In the Houston area, you at the least want a house inspection and a termite inspection on there. Uh, there are some other th some title some inspectors offer uh, they can do a scope of the sewer pipe from the house to the street to make sure there's not an issue with that because sometimes there is. Um, but once the inspector is done, if they see that there's something wrong with, say, the air conditioning, that it's not cooling as, it, as they think it should be, the buyer can then arrange to bring in AC people to take an in-depth look. An inspector can't be invasive. They can't open an AC, an, you know, a, uh, uh, a compressor on an AC or anything like that and look in. They can measure you know, the measure, you know, the readings of the air that's coming out on the heat and the cold. And based on that, tell you if they think there might be a problem or if there's something visibly they can see that's a problem. Uh, but it's not uncommon to try to bring in other specialized folks to look at some things and give you some idea of bids, um, of bids on, say, have an idea of what the cost may be to fix that. So when you know what you're getting into or what you're going to be asking the seller to take care of. In some cases, you have a tight time frame, and you may just be handing the inspection report to the seller and saying, we want these items repaired by you prior to closing, and we need the paid receipts on there. Big hint on the inspections. Very generally, although almost always, the older the house, the longer the inspection report's going to be. Because in Texas, an inspector has to inspect to what current code is. And so the older the house, the more the items there are going to be that aren't the current code. And I think I've got it farther in here, but basically, um, depending on what it is, a seller is not going to agree to bring anything up to current code. If you go into a historic home in the Heights and it's got a, you know, a stair rail that's only three feet tall because that's how they used to do them. And it's got spindles that are a foot wide. That's not going to be the code. Current code now is four feet high. No more spindles can't be more than four inches apart. Nobody's going to take out a historic staircase for you. So you got to kind of keep that in mind. What I encourage my people to be looking at is what, um, what are the major things? Are there things that are going to allow water penetration? Is the structure itself sealed up tightly? Are there true safety hazards in there versus items that may be handyman type things? Um, if you go and ask for everything, generally you get nothing. I've seen that happen before. Uh, so you wanna really hone in on the really, really important things to you on there. Now I do have cases where people have asked for what looked like minor things uh, on there and, and people have agreed to that. But if you ask them to 
fix everything on an inspection report, your negotiations are going to be more difficult. So it always requires it, it, it always requires some judicious thought and some good experience from your agent to help you through the process. Also, also so there are some things that we just see on every inspection report of a house of a certain age, and um, we can tell you that on there. We also see some cases, especially like in condominiums, where where an inspector says this is installed wrong. But it's something that cannot easily be fixed. And guess what? That is how they did every unit in that building. So those are those are a lot harder to to get through. So you want to you want to have some good experience from your agent about what their experience has been, especially on a certain house. Newer houses are a different story, and we'll talk about those in a second. Um, hey, Gargan. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Gargan. You had uh, chimed in. Yes, a couple of things. So uh, just from timeline's perspective, the inspection and the title commitment, you get it and you kind of look into it and investigate into it when you're in your option period. This is the time when you can get out of this contract for any reason, like James was saying. Um, so and James, I agree with James that you should not negotiate everything on the inspection report. But we as attorneys sometimes see the worst kind of cases. So I wanted to, if I could mm -hmm. share my, an inspection report to show sure. you what's why it's important. Uh, first thing, when you hire an inspector, the inspector's duties are generally to look at things and to kind of observe things that are visible. So they can't see any defects that are not visible to the eye. They'll so, And then the second thing to know is that you are buying a house, uh, once your inspection is done, you are buying the house as is. So it's important to read your inspection report. And if there's a note there you see, or if there's something you see that could be a red flag, it's important to investigate it further before you buy a house that could have some serious problems. So I'm I'm just going to quickly uh, share. And you should be able to screen share over. Yeah. So. This is an inspection report from our client, uh, one of our clients, and uh, the these are very simple folks. They This was the first time they were buying the house, didn't know much about what an inspection is. This is sort of what a typical inspection report looks like. Um, it says it will have different, uh, so as headings, it will have different parts of the house that the inspector has viewed. And then the inspector is going to say inspected, not inspected, not present, or, and if it's deficient, they're going to do a check mark on whether it's something was deficient. And so just looking at it, the inspector first looked at the structural systems. They'll put their notes in it as to what they saw. They'll also put some photographs, but the inspector found that the structural system here was deficient for some reason. Um, then the inspector looked at, if we go foundation elevation survey, well, there's no comment here. Then they looked at grading and drainage. They found that it was deficient. They found they looked at roof covering. They found that it was deficient. And so the inspector's report essentially tells you things that you need to maybe investigate further into it. This family, unfortunately, did, did not investigate further into it. They bought the house. And then once you buy the house, you're buying it with knowledge. You have knowledge because the inspector's report has disclosed things to you. So unfortunately, they had some knowledge of it. And, and so we had to come in and engage in litigation. But I wanted to show you an example of what an inspection report is. If you see things like that, if, if the D is checked out and if it says deficient and it says deficient in multiple parts, it's time to have a conversation with your realtor about doing further investigation, hiring somebody who, is more ex who has more expertise in these roofing or grading and drainage and look into it further before you buy the house. And this is a dumb question for me. Can you ever agree uh, to extend the option period? Yes. Yes. Most yeah. of the times the seller, or uh, James could probably answer, most of the times the sellers ask for a little bit more money to put in escrow. So initially if you put three, $400, they may say, gives another couple of hundred dollars to put an escrow to extend the option period, but it's still a small amount if you're buying a, a house that's worth hundreds yeah, of thousands. I haven't, of I haven't seen that. It's been more that you pay an additional option fee to, right. to extend the option on there. Sometimes, and there are times where sellers won't do it. There are some times where I've had it where um, 
we we were given the report in the request pretty late in the option period, and there would be a lot to for anybody to immediately grasp. And so I've had it to where, as representative seller, we've gone back to the buyer and side side and said, look, you need to extend the option period till we've got time to look through this and figure out, you know, what can be done here uh, on here. And mostly they do. In Texas, the seller can't extend the option. The buyer has to request the option extension and they have to pay the, the additional fee. But if they get it to me to me too late for my buyers to be able to make a, a good decision, uh, that in a lot of cases are actually end up being good for the buyer, um, then the deal could be off because um, I can tell when the sellers just got deer in the headlights because they're hit, be, being hit with something that's bigger than they thought and and they need some time to adjust on that. And also just um, a, a follow-up question. If you go under the option period and somebody gets an inspection and they walk away, when the new a new buyer comes up, do you have to give that new buyer the inspection report that was tendered over to you as part of that previous transaction? Yeah, if 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 because there are some times where people back out and we don't see the inspection report and we don't know what the situation is. So there's nothing that we know to disclose. Definitely, if we have an inspection report, that has to be incorporated into the seller's disclosure uh, uh, without a doubt. And, and for me, representing a, representing a seller, sometimes sellers freak out about that. But for me, as an agent, I'm like, well, no, we know more about the house and the buyer, the next buyer is going to know more about the house and their offer is going to be based on having seen this. So that if they then come back and say, well, won't you fix X, Y, and Z? It was like, well, no, you knew that <laughs> when you bought the house. We're not going to pay for that because we disclosed that that was an issue already. So to me, it can work in the seller's favor if that's uh, if having a if there's a bright side to having a contract break out, that's it. Good to hear. Um, we have about uh, 18 minutes left. Plus, uh, hopefully we can go over by five. Uh, we have a lot more to go through. Um, so, yeah, yeah let me uh, just keep going. The next process is going to be the lender is going to order an appraisal, assuming that the value is there, the lender will begin the closing process. If the value isn't there, it sets off a whole other range of, um, are y'all are y'all seeing my screen? No, 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 if you'll share your screen again. I'm sorry. Um, if there, if, there is a problem with the appraisal. It sets off a, a whole other round of negotiations between the buyer and the seller on there. Once you get through that part, and there's a whole lot of things in between, but there's not enough time to go through everything. Although I think you'll be getting a PDF that's got more information for you after this class. Uh, then you're going to maybe go to closing if my computer works. Uh, just a second here. And it's not working right. Just a second. There we go. Then you close. Um, let's go quickly into buying from a, a builder. And this generally refers to the large builders building out in the suburbs. One, when you go in, you always want to have your agent with you. Again, those people in the sales offices are very nice, but they're not your friends and they're not going to represent you. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples in a second. The builder contracts are very one-sided, tilted toward the builder. And they're not going to change their contracts for you. Their contracts are what they work off of based on the experiences of how they, of issues they have had with, with buyers in the past. So it's one of the things where you look through it. I know I've had clients read through, actually read the contract because a lot of people don't. And say, oh, God, if we handed this to our attorney, he'd never let us sign this. And, and I would agree with that. <laughs> but you just need to know that is how they work. And if you want one of their houses, you're going to be using their contract on there. Um, builders often own their own lenders and title companies. And they will uh, provide you incentives to use them. Uh, 
The only downside is you need to look at their rate compared to what your other lender might be offering. Sometimes it's better. I've had one person do the math once and he said he thought his own lender was a better deal, even taking into account all the incentives that the builder was offering on there. Uh, as an agent, the only problem I have is their title company because they work on a very rigid process and it's never getting me and my client the information I think we should have as quickly as I think we should have it as we would have on a normal resale transaction on there. Inspections, always get an inspection. A lot of people think they don't have to get an inspection because they're buying a brand new house. Brand new houses are built by humans and humans aren't perfect and they're going to make mistakes. And sometimes builders don't always do it like they should. And this is where having an agent can really come into play. Uh, just had some people close on a house out in Cane Island from one of the big builders. And we met with the builder because there's a meeting where you have where you're getting near the end of the process and they want to go over things with you. And one of the things we had with us, we just got in the inspection report. And a lot of builders will say, hand it to me, we'll take care of it. This builder said, oh, well, no, there's a lot of suggestions in here for changes. We only do code violations and there aren't any code violations. And my clients are very sweet people, um, very unassertive people. And I basically said, hold my beer, I'll take care of this. And I looked at the guy and said, but that's wrong. You, do you really wanna sell my clients a house that's not correct? And it took a little more pushing, but he finally did the things that we needed him to do on there. I also had a case where uh, buyers were building a house in League City. They lived in the Panhandle. They came down one weekend to take a look at things, called me frantic because there were several things that weren't in the spots where they were supposed to be in the house. And the sales rep told them, oh, sorry, too late. We can't fix it. And all it really took was a letter from me, an email from me, detailing everything that my client saw that was wrong. And they had photos, which I passed on. And I simply said, please tell me the date by which all this stuff will be fixed. So my experience is the builders are really quick to tell buyers no. But when somebody else is involved advocating for them, they're not, they might give a little pushback, but they're not, um, um, they're not as apt to just say, forget it, we're not going to do it. Um, and that is it. That's, uh, and the basic process is the same after that. Awesome. And James, I, I love that you have it on that slide because I'm going to switch it over uh, to Gagan here to, to talk about scholars' disclosures and some of the legal issues that can pop up with them. Sure. Um, seller's disclosures are something you get right when you sign the contract. So when you sign your contract with the with the seller, they're supposed to give you a packet of information. One of them is a seller's disclosure forms. It discloses everything that the seller knows about the house, everything good and bad. So it would have things like, does the house have a septic tank or it has regular sewage or does it have air conditioning or does it have units? Um, it also talks about has the house been flooded in the past and does the house have any issues that the seller knows about? Um, this is really important for you to look at as a buyer because the seller is essentially giving you information. Uh, if you are not looking at it and then you purchase a house and later on you find a problem with the house, you cannot then go back and have a legal claim against the seller because it was disclosed to you. So it's important to look at a seller's disclosure. Now, a couple of ways where legal problems, uh, you may have a real lawsuit is when the seller misrepresents on the disclosure. So we've had cases where the seller misrepresented that the house didn't have any mold issues. And then it turned out that the house had black mold in it. And so, or the seller mm -hmm. misrepresented that the house had public sewage, but it had a septic tank. And so then the buyer had all these issues after moving in. So important, just one takeaway from this is important to look at the seller's disclosure. And if you find something that's kind of a little bit, it catches your attention on the form, talk to your realtor about it, say, and ask them questions. Why is this this way? How, is this house on a flood, a hundred year flood plan? Has it been flooded? Uh, was there a FEMA claim made on it and things like that? Because they're going to impact your insurance policy and things like that. Charles, did you have something to add to that? 
Yeah, I was just going to add that. Um, so I, I think this is a great point in in ethical discussions too. Uh, basically, when when you have the seller's disclosures, uh, my example was in 2021 when we bought our house, the disclosures didn't list that the buyers uh, knew, or excuse me, that the sellers knew that it had aluminum wiring. And it not only had aluminum wiring, but it also had a box uh, that is known to cause fires, like uh, the 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 circuit breaker. Uh, once it does it once, uh, the likelihood of it ever tripping again is reduced by by like seventy five percent. So, it, meaning if there's too much electricity running to the house, your circuit breaker will typically shut it off. Uh, but this one wouldn't. And then aluminum wiring is notorious for. Uh, being dangerous and causing sparks. And if you overload it, there's a whole bunch of issues. And so when we got those disclosures, they had purchased the house only a few years prior. So they, they should have gotten an inspection and known that this was an issue. When we came to them afterwards, after we had the inspection, we were like, whoa, this is aluminum wiring. You said it didn't. This is super dangerous. It has that box as well, stab lock. We need this fixed. And just like James and, and Gagan said, like you can't go in and ask them to fix every little thing in that inspection report. But that one was serious. And it ended up being that they mm-hmm. reduced the cash that we needed to have on hand. And what, what I was going to point out on the ethical side, if you're representing yourself on that sale uh, and you do a seller's disclosures, it, remember that there's 4.01 of the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Procedure that say truthfulness and statements to others. And so you've got to make sure that you don't make a material false statement. And you never want to to go in, if you're representing yourself in the sale of your house later on, you never want to go in and have to make that argument. Well, this wasn't a material fact. So again, it's always best to, 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 to just double check things and triple check because here they marked no when, when clearly it should have been yes. Uh, and so that was just my part. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, so title commitment, title insurance and title commitment. Uh, going back when buying a house, you sign the contract and then you kind of have this option period to find out if there's something wrong with the house. So you get your inspection done to see if there's something wrong with the building, the structure, the roof and the plumbing. You get your title insurance to make sure that the title is clear. The title insurance is very important. Um, soon after your option period begins, the, the title company you picked, uh, and please pick a reputable one. There are tons of title companies out there. Pick one that that's well known. So the title company you pick is going to send you something called a title commitment. This is a preliminary report of the title of the house you're about to buy. It shows everything that is problematic about the house. So it, and I quickly wanted to share with you a sample title report uh, because this is important. We see it in litigation a lot. Uh, This is a title commitment for one of our clients. Uh, This is, they chose First American Title Company. Always look for Schedule C. Schedule A, B, D, and E have some standard stuff that may not be as important. Schedule C is that tells you all the things that are wrong with the title. So for example, in this case, uh, when they ran the title, uh, the title insurance company sent the title commitment in Schedule C, it shows things that are wrong. And it says on top, your policy will not cover loss, costs, attorney's fees and expenses resulting from the following. So the policy, your insurance policy will not cover problems that could arise from these things. And then it's disclosing, it's disclosing that there's a deed of trust or a loan against the property for 100,000. It's all disclosing there's a second deed of trust for another 100,000. It's disclosing that there's a third deed of trust for 34,000, fourth one 34,000, fifth one for $528,000. And then there's some issues with the homeowners association. So just going back, it's very important to look at Schedule C of the title commitment because it shows all the things that are potentially wrong with the title of the property that could be problematic in future. So once you get the Schedule C and you look at it, this is the time to go back to the seller and make sure that the seller is going to clean, clear up all of these issues with the title before you buy your property because otherwise you're buying the property with insurance, so you will have title insurance, but it's not going to cover these problems and you'll have to pay for these problems out of pocket. Yeah, and generally the title companies aren't going to uh, close a deal unless all this stuff is cleared off. Um, 
I, right. I've never seen anybody, I've never seen one close something where they did not have all these things marked off. Well, no. So yeah. I have seen where they they clear up most of it, but sometimes they insure around one or two problems, oh, okay. which means that they will cover everything but anything associated with that problem. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we've seen where they insure around it. And so you just kind of want to make sure that you know either the problems are going to be cleared up or you, they're being insured around and you know that you don't have insurance for those kind of problems. Yeah, it's huge. And um, that actually, that brought me to one other thing. I forgot about the aluminum wiring because we were talking about this as well. When it comes to insurance for your home, a lot of the times the things that are in the seller's disclosures are things that you probably need to make sure that are either addressed or the insurance company knows. Because aluminum wiring, for example, is one of those conditions where it can be mostly rectified by doing little fixes on each of the outlets because it's not generally the wire that's the issue. It's the connection point between the wire and the, the, the plug learned a lot about aluminum wiring since I bought this house. But uh, when you buy a house with aluminum wiring, you have to make sure that your insurance will cover that. If they do not cover the aluminum wiring, you could end up having insurance that won't cover damage that is caused. So make sure that you double check everything and that you, you are being upfront and honest about those defects that could affect insurance with the insurance company um, because you don't want to run down the line uh, and have an issue that's caused by the electricity and then be told, well, sorry, we won't cover. Um, so same with title, same with um, actual home insurance. Right. So once, uh, once you have, you've done your inspections, you've gotten your title commitment, the title of your property is insured, your inspections are done so you know that the house is clear of any defects, then it's kind of just time to go close. Uh, generally, the closing is done at the title uh, company's office. So you you go and the seller goes, everybody gets together with their realtors at the title company's office and you sign off on all your mortgage documents, all the closing documents. What you typically see is a stack of documents, which will include the mortgage documents and then a settlement statement that'll have all the numbers, the amount you're paying for the house, then there'll be a reduction for the down payment, there'll be a tax um, assessment, seller will pay part of the year's taxes, you'll pay part of the year's taxes, and then it'll have the final amounts that are gonna be paid. Uh, in my experience, the closing is done, at least when we bought the house, we closed, you bring cashier's checks. Uh, do not wire money to the title company, there have been a lot of problems and Charles is in a good position to tell you as a former uh, prosecutor that there are a lot, there's a lot of wire transfer fraud. So Charles, I'll let you. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll, I'll pop in here one last time uh, just to say there, there's something called business email compromise. And if you haven't experienced it, you're extremely lucky. Um, but essentially what it is, is you will have been communicating with Tiffany at Alamo Tile or whoever it is. Uh, and Tiffany will have given you instructions for how to send the money. And then the night before the transaction is supposed to go through, you get an email from Tiffany at Alamo Title. And uh, it, essentially what you're discovering is, is that you've sent the money. And then the next day at closing, they're asking, well, where's the money? Well, Tiffany used to have two Fs in her name and Alamo title was A-L-A-M-O. Uh, but when you look at the email that you received the night before, it's T-I-F-F-F-A-N-Y at A-L-A-A-M-O. And you've just sent your money to someone else. And by the time you've sent it, there's no recovery of those funds. Um, and it ends up being a criminal case. And so... It just be very, very cautious. Make sure that you communicate and verify every piece of information with the title company uh, before you send that money. And it, it usually involves a phone call from a trusted phone number that you verify and you double check. Make sure you do everything in such a way that you have absolute knowledge that you're sending it to the right person. And if you get a frantic email saying, hey, it didn't go through, send it again or do something else, verify that don't just send that money because you could be out tons of money be dealing with a huge nightmare where you've lost all of your savings um, i'm going to put the cle number into the chat uh, it's 174-231-608 uh, we have um, since we started about five minutes late uh, i i'm happy to stay on for another five minutes if our presenters are as well 
Uh, when you enter that, no, it's one hour of total CLE with 0.25 of ethics. Um, and just remember that uh, the one thing I'll emphasize one more time on ethics is that if you decide to do this yourself, if you handle this yourself, just make sure that you're following all of the ethical rules, that you're doing everything that you're supposed to, because that truthfulness and statement to others, uh, it's in the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person or fail to disclose a material fact to a third person when disclosure is necessary to avoid making the lawyer a party to a criminal act or knowingly assisting a fraudulent act per perpetrated by a client. Um, and if you're representing yourself, you have to follow those rules as well in both buying and selling to just make sure that you you remember your ethical duties if you are acting in that capacity. Even if you aren't acting in that capacity, it's best to be truthful. Um, and yeah. James and uh, Gagan, anything else that y'all would add before we hop off today? Yeah, I would like to just on the disclosure step, there are two different types of disclosure forms. The Texas Real Estate Commission has one and the Texas Association of Realtors has a much more ex extensive disclosure form, uh, which is the only one that's allowed for agents in my office to use uh, because we want there to be full disclosure. A lot of sellers think that if they disclose everything they know, nobody will ever want to buy their house. And that's not the case. I've had people disclose stuff that they never were never even brought up to us. Even after inspections, they didn't think it was a big problem. There's always a buyer for a house. The good news is it's just like what I said about the inspection reports. Put it on the disclosure. If they're making their offer, they're making their offer knowing that that's there and that protects you. You've done what you need to do. I just yesterday fired a client who made it very clear that she was not going to do full disclosure. And I just said, well, I'm sending you a termination of listing right now. You need to sign this because there's no way we're moving forward on here because I don't want Gagan coming after me. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with that. I, I like full disclosure. And most of my clients want to do it right every once in a while. And this is in 20 years. This is only the third person I've had to fire over this. So uh, keep that in mind. If you... Um, uh, if as a buyer, you're, you're given the shorter Texas Real Estate Commission uh, disclosure, it's a perfectly fine disclosure. You can't require a seller to do the longer one on there. You just have to, you know, really make certain that you get a good inspection. Um, I just had, my last comment is um, your contract that you're signing protects you. So if there's no closing, you can enforce specific performance. But if you do end up closing and after that you discover problems, it's difficult and expensive uh, hiring attorneys to do undo all of that. So make sure you review the documents, your inspection report, your title commitment, just make sure all your ducks are in a row. Uh, these things that we see as attorneys, of course, we see the worst case scenario. People come to us when things have really gone south, but uh, you know the probability of it happening is low. People have great sales every day, so I'm sure that you guys will not come across these problems, but they're good to know. Yeah, in 20 years, I think I've only had one buyer and seller um, get into a lawsuit, and it was over master bedroom drapes. Um, it had nothing to do with the disclosure. So uh, it's... Uh, um, what Gagan's talking about really is the exception and not the rule. Awesome. Great job, uh, Charles. Did, thanks, Lucy. Did anyone have any questions here in the audience? Um, They're a quiet group. Well, um, thank you all for attending. Uh, again, the CLE number is 174. 231-608. Uh, everybody, please stay safe. Apparently, it's um, there's a storm coming and it's lightning. Uh, and just be cautious. Uh, and um, thanks again for attending. And uh, if you have any questions, we will definitely, I will forward those to the presenters if you want to email me and we will forward over uh, some 
some documents that they wanted to make sure that everyone had. Uh, thank you both, James and Gagan, for, for being here and for presenting. Uh, this is a really meaningful thing. Our pleasure. Hope it helped. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. James. Thanks so much, Lucy. No, y'all did a great job. Okay. Thank you all so, so much. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Seriously. Thank y'all. Bye, y'all.